You're listening to an all new episode of Self Made Strategies. Visit selfmadestrategies.com for new episodes, information about our guests, and a whole lot more. Hey, this is Tony Lopes of Self Made Strategies, your host every week here on your favorite podcast listening app. If you haven't checked out our YouTube channel yet, please go to YouTube and search for self-made strategies, three words, and check out our channel where you can now watch our podcasts and see the awesome guests live in person and see our awesome guests talking about their self-made strategies. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and give us a thumbs up if you enjoy the video that you see or leave us a review on your favorite podcast listening app. Thanks very much. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to episode 108 of the Self-Made Strategies podcast. Our guest today is Jen Groover, who has been a top business and lifestyle contributor and content creator for major television networks such as ABC, CBS, CNBC, NBC, MSNBC, CNBC, Fox News, Fox Business News, and The CW. She and her products have also been featured on QVC. Jen has also regularly contributed editorial pieces to several prominent business magazines and online resources, including the Huffington Post, Entrepreneur Magazine, Inc. Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, Positively Positive, and The Story Exchange. Her products, brand, and work have been featured in hundreds of media outlets, including O, The Oprah Magazine, Red Book, People, U.S. Weekly, Success, and Entrepreneur. Jen's success skyrocketed with the creation of the Butler Bag, the world's first compartmentalized handbag. That became a multi-million dollar brand and has not stopped since. Jen springboarded the Butler Bag's success into an entire lifestyle brand found at a variety of price points and well-known retailers, which led to the creation of subsequent lifestyle brands, Leader Girls and Empowered by Jen Groover. Leader Girls teaches young girls the importance of empowerment through play, while the recently launched Empowered by Jen Groover brand, including her one-hour PBS special and book, comprises a variety of consumer products that encompass her quotes and inspire people to live life with passion and purpose. Jen has also been ranked number eight by SAP in the top 51 influencers of human potential. Now, Jen is helping individuals like you get more out of their own lives with her book, The More Method. Here are Jen Groover's self-made strategies. Hey, Jen, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate you making the time to join us remotely, even though we're pretty close because I'm in Philly and you're somewhere in the media area, roughly. But uh, because of COVID-19, we're still doing this remotely. But I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So, so much about your background, the butler bag and so many of the other things that you've done. I'm really, really excited to talk to you about First of all, how you went from developing a product like the Butler Bag to then becoming more of this empowerment and leadership visionary, if you will, um, touted by many, many outlets, obviously, and you work with a lot of really interesting and cool entrepreneurs also. So looking to pick your brain on some of this stuff and we'll, of course, dive into your book, which is called The More Method. So thanks for your time. Let's start with the Butler Bag. How did you come up with the idea for the Butler Bag to begin with and then kind of walk us through the life cycle of that product and, and your involvement in it? Sure. So I had already been an entrepreneur, um, started my first business right out of college in the fitness industry and, um, was really comfortable with being uncomfortable and constantly growing and thirsting for new knowledge. And I, um, had been a spokesperson for QVC for other brands. And I was just always fascinated with people's story of how they created things. And I, would always joke that I had like an idea journal, like so big filled with ideas. But as I worked at QVC, I started to learn like there's a formula that predicts success of certain products. And, and the more I learned the formula and the more I realized that everybody that was creating those other products were just like me, you know, they were just determined entrepreneurs. They weren't usually like, they were like me in school, like the B student, they weren't like super academic. Um, which many entrepreneurs um, you'll find aren't. So, because we're usually like trying to color outside of the lines. So um, I kept thinking someday, one of these ideas I'm going to bring to market. 
So having a business and bringing a product to market are very different. Uh, bringing a product to market is way scarier. Uh, you're way more of a financial risk. Um, and so I was ready to take the leap when I uh, came up with the concept for the Butler bag, uh, which came one night when I went to the grocery store with my uh, infant twins and um, was just running in to get dinner and put them down to pay for my my food. And I couldn't find my credit card in my bag that was filled with stuff upon stuff and um, dumped my bag out for to find it. And I'm thinking as I'm dumping my bag out, this is like insane. I'm panicking. There's all these people rolling their eyes behind me. My kids are now both wailing, crying. And um, I thought that this is insane. Like women's handbag is a bucket. Like it's literally a bucket where you can't find anything. So my mom had this mantra when I was young, which she would say, you can't complain about something unless you back it up with a solution. So that was programmed in me. So every time I would catch myself complaining, I'd be like, what's the solution? So as I'm walking out of the grocery store that night, I was like, this is a problem and there needs to be a solution. And I was like, well, I can't really draw well, not even stick figures very well. Uh, I'm not an engineer. Like, how would I solve this problem? And so I kind of went home and shelved the idea, not sure how to, to do it and or if I could do it. And then nine months later, um, I was unloading my dishwasher, which was a regular routine. Um, but I believe the shift that happened for me to see the opportunity in the dishwasher was a lot of the mindset training that I work that I had done in between the problem and creating the solution. So as I'm unloading my dishwasher, I'm taking out the utensils and the utensil tray and I, it hits me. Oh my God, this is how I want everything in my bag to be standing up straight bird's eye view. Everything's in its own space and compartment. So I took the dishwasher tray out of the dishwasher, stuck it in my, my handbag. And it was like music came out of it. It was like, wow. So um, I knew that was the solution. I quickly started Googling compartments and handbags, handbags with compartments, like all the different configurations and um, realized what I wanted to create didn't exist. Uh, but again, I think a really important part of that story is uh, unloading the dishwasher was my task since I was a child. And it's just crazy that after all this time, for all those months that I had had this problem that I knew, I truly believe the shift in my perception and my beliefs allowed me to see the dishwasher tray as a multi-million dollar opportunity that I never could see before that moment. And, and that's what really fascinates me, the psychology and the understanding of beliefs and the fact that I did that task on a regular basis and never saw it for what that was until that day uh, was, was really fun for me looking back to it. So that then began my scavenger hunt to my next level of success. Yeah, that's such an interesting story because it's something that's kind of hiding in plain sight, right? And like you yeah. said, you're just doing it on a routine basis and you don't realize that it's really just part of your origin story that you've been doing dishes for however many years up to that point. And then all of a sudden, boom, it just clicks right in your brain. And you just know that this is the solution to the problem that you were having with your bag. Super cool. So yeah. how do you go from the Butler bag then to becoming a business and lifestyle contributor, which eventually leads to, of course, leader girls and empowered by Jen, which is what I really, really want to focus on and the more method, but I'm kind of just getting the audience here up to speed to everything that is Jen Groover. Yeah. So the foundation of that was really set in the fitness industry. I was a national level fitness competitor. I was doing speaking engagements all over the world, um, teaching about wellness and, and nutrition and fitness. Um, and so, so another really big part of this, I said the mindset training I was doing during that time period as a fitness competitor, I was luckily immersed in this world of thought leaders, um, around human behavior and constant improvement. And so um, I found some really incredible mentors along the way who were constantly teaching me about up leveling and living to your potential and expanding your potential. So that became so much of just who I was and how I lived my life. And um, so when I when I turned the Butler Bad Company into a million dollar company in the first year of business, that was really profound 
especially as a female in 2006, before technology and social media was what it is today, it's really unheard of. So people were like, wait, what, how did you do that? Like <laughs> what was the secret? And so I had the opportunity to really have a voice uh, where when I would be asked about my, my business, I would always talk about the mindset part of it and, and the preparation of the mindset that's needed in order to be that successful. So that then evolved into me getting asked to speak at a lot more events, to be on TV all the time, to contribute to uh, business and lifestyle magazines. And, um, and it just kind of snowballed from there. I, the funniest thing is when I was a kid, I had the biggest fear in the world of public speaking, biggest fear. I mean, like I would get sick. My mom forced me to do, it was back then it was called forensics. My mom forced me to do forensics and I really did not like her for making me do it because I hated (laughs) it so much. And um, now I'm grateful, obviously, that she forced me to do it, but I still hated it. And I shied out of the limelight. And um, when I was deciding to be a spokesperson for QVC, I was scared to death to do it because when I was also, when I was a kid, my mom had a TV show and she put me on the show and other kids at school started seeing it. And of course kids do started making fun. Right. So that's what made me start to shy away. Um, so when I went on QVC, I forced myself to do it. And I, something in my, my head kept saying, you'll never get all the things you want in life. If you don't do this, you need to do this in order to keep moving along. So, um, that QVC training is powerful training. I mean, we get taught how to sell uh, $5,000 a minute, $13,000 a minute during the holidays. So wow. um, any person that recognized in the media, any person recognized that I had been on QVC knew I had the ability to effectively use airtime. So uh, that helped exponentially as well. But um when I was in the fitness industry, I never felt like I was a speaker. Um, I just felt like I was a teacher. Uh, so as long as I can talk about what I was passionate about, I just would talk and, and, and people would feel invigorated by that. So it became more of this. I I started being more coined as like this motivational speaker, inspirational speaker. I never once had called myself empowerment. Um, however, that kind of got I got labeled that way by a lot of other people because I was a young female doing some pretty significant things that made other women take notice and be inspired and look up to me to try and have a model or someone to model. And, and I think, you know, for me also my mission, when I started to realize people were putting me in that category, again, I never once claimed myself to be that. I think it's a slippery slope. Um, but what I did intentionally do is I always wanted to, I didn't, I'm not a feminist by any means at all. Um, and, and maybe that's like the old school traditional side of me. However, I believe women should be empowered with their own financial means. Um, and, and so when, when I did start to get labeled like this, I was always very clear that I believe that in, in females being feminine and feminine success, right? So the energy of masculine success and the energy and feminine success are different. But prior to that, most of the women that were out there other than Sarah Blakely had this bitchiness to them, which I totally don't agree with at all. So I used it as an opportunity to really create this narrative also of like, you can be a woman and be nice and kind and thoughtful and fun and silly and be successful at the same time. So that was, that was fun for me to see that, that, that conversation really starting to percolate, uh, as as everything snowballed in that direction. Yeah. Amazing. So again, leader girls is something that developed out of that. And that's where you empower young women with the skills that then they can take to go on to become leaders when they grow up, become entrepreneurs, go into the job market, right? Can you tell us a little bit about Leader Girls, how you developed it and what the program entails? So if that anyone is listening, has a, a, a young you know daughter, sister, cousin in their lives that they want to steer in this direction, they can, they can find the help that they're looking for. Yeah. So, so Leader Girls was interesting. Once once you learn the formula of success, you can duplicate it over and over and over again. Uh, so once that happened with the Butler bag and it hit 1 million in one year, 10 million in the second year, 
I knew the formula and I, my creativity just went off the charts and I was creating things left and right. And the fun thing after having accomplished that is I, then when I say I have an idea, people are like, Oh, okay. What? Yeah. Now what it's a order? different ball game. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of more people had faith in me so I could get things accomplished a lot more easily, which was nice. But, um, with the leader girls, I took my girls to Disney and as we're walking around and it's all this princess stuff and princess stuff. And I was like, this is so antiquated. <laughs> like, why aren't there like, cause my degree is in education and psychology mm-hmm. and in the early childhood education and training. I learned so much that how much kids shape their view of the world with what they're playing with and, and how critical that really is. And people just think it's, Oh, it's kids are just playing what they're is shaping their view of the world. So I'm leaving Disney and I'm like, this is not like, I don't want, and, and this is going to sound like I am a feminist, but I didn't want my kids like, ha, like thinking this whole like princess world and like calling themselves. I, I just, to me, it was not what I wanted. I wanted them to learn how to be confident and strong and be able to provide for themselves. N- not And that goes back to my childhood because my dad controlled my mom through money and manipulated her through money. And I always uh, believed in financial independence because of that. Right. Um, That's a large part of the reason that you went into psychology to begin with. If I'm not mistaken, it's in the more method in the beginning of the book that you talk about how the relationship between your parents and your father was an attorney. You guys moved to Philly. And that's what eventually led you to go into psychology, just as a background for the listeners. Yes. So um, trying to figure out my dysfunctional childhood and, <laughs> and psychology was the only time I ever got excited about school because I was like, right. wow, this is helping me make sense of my crazy childhood and 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 everybody and everything. So, uh, yeah. So so then with the leader girls, I wanted um, I wanted uh, something that my daughters could play with that taught them how to be entrepreneurs, how to use their creativity, how to lead, be leaders. Uh, And then I pitched that to this company, Playworld, and they licensed it right out of the gate without even a prototype, which was unbelievable. That was like so fun for me. Um, And then uh, from there, then I created Empowered, the jewelry line um, and other lifestyle products, uh, which that came to me from these women who, had a uh, jewelry manufacturing company in Canada who said, we would love to take your quotes because they've heard me speak or, and they saw like articles that are like, you always have these quotes, these like sound bites. We want to put it to jewelry. And I was like, well, that's fun. And I would love that. <laughs> so that's kind of how that all snowballed from there too. Amazing. So I resonate a lot with this because we talked about this before we jumped on to record this on our intro call. I'm an attorney by trade and academically, and obviously I run the podcast and I talk to entrepreneurs like yourself or innovators like yourself and kind of pick your brain and get to have that experience. But luckily for me, I've sort of overcome that wave that people get hit with when they're like us where it's, you know, why aren't you focused? Why aren't you just going down the traditional path? Why aren't you just doing what others are doing? Right. Mm-hmm. And it's in your, it's in your more method book as well, essentially yeah. that if, and I'm uh, sort of summarizing here, but essentially that if you're doing what everybody else is doing, you're not going to do anything special, right? Yeah. You're just in line like everybody else. Correct. And I actually, I saw a meme the other day that made me think of you and the book, which was something along the lines of nobody ever won a Nobel prize by working nine to five, right? Correct. If you follow the <laughs> traditional path, it's not going to happen. That's true. Um, so what do you say to someone who's younger or, or even someone who's at a midpoint in their career, but looking to transition or looking to chase their dream, or maybe they've lost their job because of COVID-19 and now they're taking this opportunity to try that side hustle out that they've been thinking about. What do you say to someone who's getting sort of beaten down by others in their circle that are telling them, you know, why can't you just follow the traditional path or why can't you just, you know, stick? Yeah. Why can't you just stick to doing what everybody else is doing basically? Yeah. Well, it's definitely not a safe path. That's for sure. (laughs) uh, As everyone's, I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely. Right. Um, to me, safety is being able to be agile and quick and pivot 
Um, and so people that follow that safe narrative, that safe belief, uh, and minimize their dreams are minimizing their, their passion for life, their desires. To me, if somebody says they want to do it, I say, just do it and do it now. I mean, everyone's dynamics are a little bit different. Some might have kids and they have to support families. So they have to transition safely. Um, but every day they should still be doing something working towards that, that goal. Um, and, and your uniqueness is your power. So owning your uniqueness and being different is actually an enormous advantage for entrepreneurs. And, and I have a saying that, um, is what was part of the brain training that was critical for me to see the dishwasher tray as an opportunity was recognizing that I had this incredible fear of failure um, because of programming from my father when I was younger. And, and so I did things that seemed really big and cool to other people, but for me towards my potential it was just not that big. So I wanted to go bigger. I wanted to live more boldly. And I recognize that that fear of failure was what was holding me back from the next level success. And I had this mantra, I have more fear of regret than I have a failure. And I would like literally reprogrammed my brain saying that mantra all day, every day or affirmation. And, and then it just kind of became me. So, um, you know, what do I say to everybody is have more fear of regret than failure. And, that came to me when I was sitting literally on a rocking chair, in a rocking chair on my front porch, my kids were taking a nap and I was reading fast company magazine. And I saw a company that came a hundred million dollars in three years. And I had the same exact idea in my idea journal. And I felt such a sinking pity feeling in my stomach of why did they do it? And I did not And, and I felt um, that living with that level of regret is so much worse. I didn't want to be an old person sitting in a rocking chair thinking woulda, shoulda, coulda. And that forced me to take action. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that one of the things that, you know, you often hear that same story from others, right? Mm -hmm. I had this idea that somebody else took and turned into a hundred million dollar company. And the question always is, well, what was the difference? What stopped you? And I'm not criticizing you, certainly, but I'm saying, to those who are listening right right now, what is stopping you from doing it? And yes, everybody has different circumstances. You may have a health issue. You may have other things going on. But if you're sitting on the couch watching Netflix, mm -hmm. that's time you could be using towards achieving that extra goal. For example, this podcast is recorded frequently on off hours. This is in the in the early evening that we're sitting here recording this. I work as a lawyer full time during the day. I'll sometimes record on the weekends. I edit whenever I can find, you know, an hour or two to go and edit. I'll work on these projects and prospecting whenever I get five minutes while I'm at lunch. I'm researching, you know, who are the upcoming guests? Who am I looking at? That's time. That's valuable time. And an often forgotten thing is time is the most valuable resource that you have. Yeah. You are both the oldest that you have ever been and the youngest that you were ev will ever be right now. Correct. So, you know, the opportunity is now is this is the time to go out and execute. And often, you know, people sit on the couch and criticize coaches or focus on, you know, what the sports team is doing. And I'm a sports guy. I love sports. But instead of doing that, go out and execute, right? Yes. They're out there executing. So right. you go out there and do the same. Exactly. So um, it, it's really awesome to, to meet someone who, who shares that mindset. And you have a lot of courses at jengroover.com as well that can help people to sort of find their path in life, mm -hmm. to improve their emotional intelligence. And then that leads us to The More Method, which is your second book, right? Correct. Yes. Um, so The More Method was actually... Uh, something that came to me in the middle of the night. Um, I was actually working on another book during that time period called the operator's manual for life. And, um, I started seeing all these, uh, emotional intelligence experts popping up. And, and that's kind of where I was a thought leader in that space around emotional intelligence and, and the true application of it. And I started thinking like, oh my gosh, all these like emotional intelligence experts are popping up out of nowhere. And what makes me different? What separates me from them? 
So how to ask myself, um, so there's this inquiry process that if you ask yourself questions before bed, um, usually your subconscious mind will bring the answers to the surface pretty quickly as, as you go into, into, your, into your sleep. So this is what happened that night. I asked myself, what makes me different? What do I do? What's my value proposition? What do I do? And I woke up about three o'clock in the morning with clarity. You teach people how to get more of what they want in life. That's what you do, whether it's relationships, whether it's business, whether it's happiness, whether it's health and well-being, because it was always hard. People couldn't put their finger on like, well, what do you do? Because you have all these areas of expertise. What are you really teaching? And emotional intelligence is just a, a single terminology to people that they don't really understand. So I call my, and then it came quickly to me too, more is an acronym and just like literally like a divine download. I knew what the acronym stood for. So I called my publisher the next day. I was like, stop the presses. We're doing a different book. This book is the the book before the operator's manual for life. And um, she loved it. She was like, oh my gosh, this is so great. Now get it written really quick. So, um, you know, to me, the more method was bringing together. I teach My degree, as I mentioned, is in psychology and and education, but then my continued education was in physiology and nutrition as a fitness expert. And then I continued to dive obsessively into quantum physics, into metaphysics, into neuroscience and into Buddhism, always on this search of like, how do you become more? How do you biohack? How do you time hack? And, uh, and, And this thirst of information to always learn it and then teach it to others, but in a way that's digestible. So the more method was basically me bringing all of these disciplines together in a digestible framework that people can literally apply to their life immediately to get more of what they desire in life. And, and, and there's simple questions that I basically suggest throughout the book is some, some, some framework or some, um, constants is I always tell people to audit, audit your life on an ongoing basis. And I created auditing checklists so that mindfulness seems more tangible. And then I always say, is what you're doing hurting you or helping you? Is it elevating you or or bringing you down? And if we always just ask those questions in life, is this hurting me or helping me? Am I working smarter or working harder? Am I going up or am I going down? We can make better choices more quickly. And so um, the more math that I was so excited about. Um, unfortunately, the book launch was happening starting in March. Well, in, in February, I was in Asia doing the book tour and I was supposed to start the book tour in March. Um, and that came to a screeching halt uh, with COVID. So a lot of my, I had over like 150 speaking engagements canceled or scheduled or uh, brought to technology. So uh, it was a different year than I expected last year, but nonetheless, it was. It was, uh, to me, the more method is timeless uh, and it's meant for anyone at any stage of life to get from where they are to where they want to go. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic book, honestly. And a lot of the things that you talked about, quantum physics, uh, Buddhism, meditation, all of those things kind of are put into a very practical way that you can apply them to your everyday life. Mm -hmm. Uh, You don't have to go become a monk and climb the mountain. You can just (laughs) kind of get the more method right for yourself here. And again, the more method stands for mindfulness in everything you do. Optimization of body and brain responsive versus reactive lifestyle and excelling in every aspect of life. So you obviously you meditate. Do you meditate on a daily basis? I shouldn't say obviously. Mm -hmm. Do you meditate? I do. Uh, okay, so what style of meditation do you do and what advice do you have for anybody who's thinking about incorporating meditation into their lives? So meditation was really hard for me because my mind is so busy all the time. And I felt like I wasn't, every time I try it or even think about it back in the day, I would feel like it was kind of like a waste of time. And that, and that, that was even after I, there's so much research that proves it's not a waste of time. But once I can actually feel like I was doing something with it, then I was able to adapt it. And I think that's really important for a lot of people. Um, So the way I look at meditation is it's like when you wake up in the morning, your brain is like a clean, organized closet. 
Everything has a space. It's all neatly organized. By three o'clock in the afternoon, your brain looks like a cluttered closet with everything just thrown everywhere. So it's harder to access the files and stay sharp. So I use meditation in the middle of the day, like towards like the like three o'clock time frame, as a way to reorganize my closet. Um, and so it feels purposeful. Um, and I know when I do it, I'm sh- more sharp. I'm have more energy, have more patience. So I'll do um, a late afternoon or mid afternoon to late afternoon meditation. And I use binaural beats. I never got to the place that monks get ever on my own. Um, but binaural beats basically force your brain because of the, the um, frequencies, force your brain into a meditative state. You also talk about another practical thing that I personally love. First and foremost, you talk a lot about journaling prompts throughout the More Method book, and you do have a More Method journal that people can also get as a companion for the book, correct? Correct, yeah. Yeah. And so I love that you talk about how you have to write down your ideas and your goals because there is so much more power in literally old school, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about old school, not a stylus, not your thumbs, not your iPhone. Exactly. Jen is actually holding up a (laughs) pen and notebook. Uh, And again, you should watch this on YouTube. If you, if you're listening to this and not watching it on YouTube, go check it out on our YouTube channel. But um, yes, writing it down. I have found the same thing in my own life. I'm also a big fan of Dr. Joe Dispenza, who you remind me so much of, of him and his book becoming supernatural. I see a lot of similarities and he talks about that in that book as well, that if you write things down, literally there's a power, there's a different energy to it. And you talk about that in your book. Yeah, uh, there is. I learned that I, I, I believe. So I teach a lot of people about procrastination. Um, and part of procrastination is finding value in achieving things. And usually those people are people that parents uh, never force them to see things through, let them kind of quit a sport that they didn't like in the middle of it. And, and so that's uh, to me fascinating. So one of the first things I teach them to do is write a to-do list, like write it not on their phone, but write it because it's so much more power to your brain and then cross things off of the to-do list and program your brain achievement or high five or whatever it is that you want to say to yourself that you literally become, uh, you become excited and thirsting to achieve your next thing so that you become more and more productive. Um, the same with writing your dreams down, your goals, your visions. Um, but one of the key things I want to point out to people in, in the book and I talk about it a lot in the book in the beginning, I feel in doing all this work, the first question, the most important question to move forward is not around goals. It's around what do you want more of, right? So what do you want more of sounds so simple, but it's so profound. And, and why it's so profound is it gets to the heart, to the root, the core of your desires. And so a lot of times people will say, I want more time, more money. You know, those are external things that you think are going to bring you happiness or whatever. That's what you have to understand. What are you thinking those things are going to do for you? Because if you get money, but you're not clear in your desires, that money isn't going to make you happier. If you wanted happiness, that's what you should be searching for. So or working towards. So um, what I find is like, I'll say to somebody who says they want more money. Well, um, you know, what do you want to do with that? Well, I want security for my family and I want to have time freedom to travel. But why? And as I keep asking why and peeling it back, I come to find out that when they were younger, they didn't have money and they felt disappointed because they couldn't do things they wanted to do. And they felt uh, scared because maybe they were afraid that their parents couldn't pay for certain things. So what they're really searching for money isn't money. It's they're searching for safety. They want more safety in their lives. They want more uh, opportunity to not be disappointed in their lives. They want to feel more in control of their fate. So that's really what they're looking for. And money is just a external demonstration of that. But the more we understand why we want these things, the more we get fulfillment in having these things, the more we understand the purpose of them, the value of them. Yeah, exactly. I I think you put it so succinctly and the book is filled with just great practical advice to really just kind of get more organized in terms of how to achieve your goals and desires. And 
keeping in mind, like you said, that a lot of times it's not about the money. It's just about doing things that fulfill you Mm -hmm. and that add a lot of value to your life. And then subsequently will make you a better person going out, adding value into other people's lives as well. Yeah, Um, for sure. You can find the book on Kindle. You can find it on Amazon. uh, Pretty much everywhere books are sold or certainly at jengroover.com. Jen, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Thank you.